And good morning. I am Anne, the one that just muted Mary by mistake. This year, 2022, is our theme. Uh, sorry, this year, 2022, our theme is taking a deep dive. We are in a new and powerful year of rebuilding, and we will benefit from practicing and fine-tuning our spiritual tools. This week, we welcome Reverend and Kelly Azola as our special guest speaker. She will be speaking about Myrtle Fillmore and how there is a danger in listening to only a single story, which can easily lead to stereotyping. And there is so much more. So let's hear Reverend Kelly as she takes us through this amazing journey about Myrtle Fillmore as a healer. So sit back and relax as we take another deep dive at Unity. And now, let us extend a warm Oscar welcome to Reverend Kelly Isola. There you go. Where's the snaps? Come on, wake up, everybody. Put your hands right by the camera and snap. Snap, snap, snap. Turn your cameras on. Snap it up. Come on, wake up. Look up. Thank you, Deborah. Love that. The head thing. Yeah. Work it, get the life. I mean, what was the affirmation? It was about life, right? Being alive. That means we move our bodies, which is part of what, what you know, what we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, the uh, first of all, thank you for having me back, and I am really excited about this this series because uh, I'm I've spent thousands of hours in the archives at Unity Village reading. Uh, huge chunks of um, letters that Myrtle wrote that have never been published. Um, so when I do the title, it's um, the danger of a single story. It's not the. It's not about listening to it. It's about the danger of the single story that we create, the unexamined, unconscious assumptions that we have about. Um, one, I'm going to focus on Myrtle, but we do it all the time with everybody in our life. We see a little slice and and unconsciously it's not it has nothing to do with, you know, whether or not we're well-meaning and we have good hearts and we're kind. It has nothing to do with that. It's how we operate. We have unconscious, unexamined assumptions when there's when there's little blanks in the brain, it fills it in with information, whatever information is handy. And so that's how you get a single story or that's how you get a story that, you know, is incomplete. It's never, um, you know, there's, you know, we don't ever have the full picture of, of people, um, no matter how long we may know them. Um, it's fascinating when, uh, when I open a, a class and I ask people to not just, you know, share their name or something, but, um, but also tell us something that um, people wouldn't know about you. Right. And what I direct people to is don't tell me anything unity. Don't tell me anything spiritual. Don't tell me anything, you know, sacred. Don't tell, tell me something that somebody wouldn't know about you. And the things that I find out, I love to bake bagels. You know, I speak, you know, Swahili. You know, I grew up and when I was in elementary school, when I was, you know, um, you know, eight years old, I lived for three years in Ecuador, you know, or. I, you know, my favorite spice is fennel. You know, the things that don't seem like maybe they may not, they might not make it onto the important list, but they're these little things about each other that we just don't know, right? And how many people, even in a Zoom, um, uh, would, um, you know, how many people's homes have you seen that you haven't previously? Like, wow, I didn't know you had that painting hanging on the wall. Right? How many people's homes have you been invited into and learned more about them just by showing up here? So the danger of a single story, the reason I call it that is because there is a danger in a single story. We, um, we think we know, and, and, and Anne um, mentioned it when she said that you know, that's how stereotypes happen. That is how stereotypes happen. It's not that there may not be some truth in a stereotype. The problem is, is that it's always incomplete. Um, so the brain um, creates images of what's familiar. And then the less of a fan, um, it's less of a fan of what's not familiar. So it fills in the little holes. Um, so that's, that's, so the danger, and if you've, 
if you just search TED Talks, you'll find um, there is a, a fabulous uh, 10, 12 years old now, but it's called The Danger of a Single Story. But really the assumptions that we have about people um, and, and look at it, what assumptions have people made about me? right? Just by looking at me. People very often, this is this is one. There you go, Heather. Thank you. I love chocolate milk, right? Um, I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. I love Brussels sprouts. Um, people have an assumption. I often hear they assume that I'm an extrovert because I can, because I love to teach, because I'm a public figure, because I'm out there and I can be up and I can be loud, like do those extroverted what traditionally are labeled as those extroverted things, but I'm not. I actually technically kind of fall right in the middle between introvert and extrovert because it's a spectrum. You can move yourself on. It's not a, just because I've been labeled an introvert doesn't mean I could stay there. I can actually learn to change myself, but, but it's just an assumption that people have. And so in the danger of the single story is we don't really ever get to know each other really, you know, continuing expanding that. We know each other and there's always more. Um, yes, Heather, and the single story we tell ourselves is often the most troubling. Yeah, we, we're really good at, uh, we could say, you know, we're, okay, this is totally off topic, but we're really good at saying, um, you know, well, you know, I'm impatient, you know, I'm kind of an impatient person or, you know, I'm really kind of type A personality or I'm really this, right? And we just say, we leave it at that. But God forbid we go, you know, I'm really very compassionate, except last Tuesday, right? Like we stick this little disclaimer on it rather than claiming I'm compassionate. We can do it with the stuff that's not maybe our favorite pieces about us or maybe not be the most connecting, you know, uh, behaviors, you know, connect me deeply with people might be some behaviors that people want to run screaming from the building over. Um, but we have this tendency not to claim, you know, I'm a giving person. Yeah, except last week when I didn't take my mother's call, right, or, or whatever. So yeah, so we do, we also create the single, the, the single story of ourselves. And the danger of that really is, is the twofold piece of that, is claiming my full humanity and my full divinity and being that witness for you as well, like having you be able to claim your full humanity, your full divinity. Um, the single story creates stereotypes. And again, as I said, it's not that there may not be truth in them, but they're incomplete, right? It's only by finding the other, it's almost like, okay, lots of different camera views and let's capture them all. Um, you know, single story uh, stereotypes. So let's think for a minute. Let me give you a little a um, few bullet points. What are some of the assumptions we have about or stereotypes um, that you that you know or or you may realize you've had over the years? You know, overweight people, um, people that are unemployed, um, religious creeds, um, spiritual practices. People that are on corners holding up cardboard signs. Right? People with depression. Right? We just have some, I'm not suggesting, you know, having, of course you could do this during the spiritual cafe afterwards, talk about it. Um, but you know, that doesn't, the danger of the single story doesn't get healed and, and expanded if we're not willing to say, oh yeah, I've thought that, or I think that being willing to own the, those assumptions. Well, the same is true for Myrtle Fillmore. So do me a favor, if you have access um, to the chat, um, what are some of your assumptions or beliefs about Myrtle Fillmore? Anything, doesn't matter. You're not gonna get graded. Maybe secretly behind the scenes, I'll send a note to Ann and Cheryl, but you're not gonna get Forward thinking, didn't like to cook. Dedicated, wise, she can do what I cannot. So those of you that can't 
through the chat. I'll give you a few that are here. Wise woman. She didn't like to cook. She's the true force behind the birth of unity. Um, forward thinking. Healed herself through her faith. Strong, intuitive, dedicated, progressive, a pacifist. Tough, independent woman. She knew she was a child of God. Visionary. Okay. Yeah, so those are some things about her. Um, some I may or may not agree with after pouring over lots of letters. Um, the ones that uh, certainly was dedicated, right? If he, so here's a, here's a first, let me dispel one myth. Very often we hear, and this may not be everybody here, we hear, you know, uh, you hear that um, Charles was the head and Myrtle was the heart, you know, of unity. And it's just not so. It's just, it's not even remotely so. Um, Myrtle was actually the brains. Myrtle was very analytical. She was very linear. There was a method to the madness for this prayer. And she did it. She equated it to mathematics, right? She's the one who went to school. She's the one that got a degree for teaching. She was the teacher in the classrooms. She, the reason that, that people have this part of their story of her being the heart is that when you read her letters, she's, you know, she sounds caring and she connects with people and she thanks them. She opens up almost every letter with, you know, something around glad that they've written, you know, I'm, it's a joy to connect with you. Something that affirms the person's presence. Pretty much every letter she opens with that. And then she launches into, she's, and she's not, I wouldn't say she's rude, you know, but she's pretty direct. She does, she's very clear. Like you can write to us. This is Kelly's 21st century, you know, 2022 uh, translation. So she does tell people, so great, we'll pray with you and you have work to do. You have work to do. If you are not doing the prayers, then there's no point in us doing it. And I've even, and I've uh, seen letters where she invites the person to stop writing. Please stop writing to us. You're not willing to do the work. We stop writing. And I'm not making that up. She's, she is, so she's very clear. She's very dedicated, Anne said dedicated. Um, she's very strong, but she's, you know, she's, they're both head and heart, right? Um, so that's one of those things about Myrtle that, that people don't, may not know is that she's, she's very much, she's very educated. In fact, she went to Oberlin College, which is in Ohio um, here in the United States. And that was the first school to allow women and blacks to attend university. So she, um, to um, um, not for blacks to attend university because there were other universities, but at the same time um, for blacks, for, but for women. So she was in a college, in a university that the first one in our country here in the US to allow women. So think of the mindset that she's in. It's not for the faint of heart. You know, she really, if anybody carries around an image of Myrtle with a little pillbox and pearls, you can take that off the screen, right? Um, she would, She read, she read a lot. She read from the time she was a small child. She talks about in some of the letters of reading books that uh, were meant only for the boys. She was told, don't read those, those are for the boys. And she of course went and read them anyway, um, you know, when no one's looking, um, which personally I love, cause that's what I would do, that's what I did. Um, she, um, you know, there's a historical context for, for Myrtle Fillmore. You know, by the time they got here to Kansas City, they, um, it was a time when there was an, an enormous, enormous amount of um, change going on. There was an enormous amount of invention going on just when unity is getting started. Um, there's um, 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 the x-ray machine right, is being invented, airplane is, you know, aviation is starting to get going, um, cars, uh, th there's just, there's all this invention going on out, in, you know, here in the U.S. and the world that is, you know, enormous change, um, and she's in the middle of that, 
you know, when they get here to Kansas City, Missouri, there's already a world going on that's very different from the one they came from. She does a lot of reading. She quotes other people in her letters. She refers to the Lankavatara Sutras, um, the Vedic teachings, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, she, she quotes other people in lessons and letters. Um, she's bringing in ideas and readings from many different places um, and her practices, right? She was raised conservative Methodist and it was pretty clear that doesn't work for me. And, um, and just went and figured out her own method to her madness. The other thing about, you know, her healing journey is there is the, you know, the story of she had tuberculosis and cured herself in two years, which isn't, we don't really know that she had tuberculosis. What we know is that she had tubercular conditions. And we know that within a couple of years of practicing what she discerned as her healing and prayer practice, relieved herself of many symptoms. You know, today, if she were to <clears throat> sit in front of a, you know, a, a medical doctor, a homeopathic doctor, she would describe symptoms that she had that, that today we would, oh, that's, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, arthritis, migraine headaches, um, stress. She was a very anxious woman. And that comes out in her letters, right? And even she didn't, she always, always Raise your hand if you have kids. Most of you don't have your video on, but I would encourage you to put your video on so that you can connect. Hello. Right. Those that have your hand up, you have kids. Ever feel anxious about not being a good parent or not doing it right? Or I could have done this different, could have done it better. Something's lacking. That was Myrtle Fillmore. She wrote about it her whole life. Now, the, the degree of anxiety and the intensity certainly came down over time. You know, you, most of you know, as we do our work, as we, our spiritual practices and we engage in those, we, you know, we start to heal, you know, the wounds and the, the, uh, the senses of inadequacy and unworthiness and things that, that we've been carrying around, right? Our single story that we've been carrying around, we begin to heal that and expand our own story and own other chapters. Right, including the one that says, I have the capacity to do this. Right, um, I have the capacity to do this. Um, she, um, she really, uh, she looked at, at individuals, you know, for, for the healing journey. She really looked at um, each of us as one, I had mentioned the, the mathematical equation thing. She really does hold to that. And, and in Myrtle, uh, in Healing Letters, which are, um, is really a book of, most people know Myrtle through Healing Letters and How to Let God Help You, those two books. Get a picture of Myrtle, but it's an incomplete picture, in part because you don't have the letter the person wrote in. All we have is what Myrtle said to them, and there's a whole lot more when you have the two pieces together. That being said, she, um, she was clear in when she would write back to someone at some point in the letter, she's addressing what one of the chapters in healing letters is called threefold healing, right? Which is looking at body, mind, spirit, or body, mind, soul. Here's the little hiccup around that is soul and spirit are not the same thing, but sometimes she uses them interchangeably. Sometimes they're written about as two very different things. So it, another, I'm not going to, I'm not going to unpack that for you. I'm giving it to you um, just so you can walk away today with more questions than answers. But um, as a but as a um, a way to recognize that there's more to this story. But she threefold healing because she believed there was we had to there were things we have to do. Just like if you're not going to pray, if you're not going to do this and this and this, then please stop writing us. We can't help you, right? Um, and other times we're happy to do this. And here's what you have to do. Are you, are you doing your own prayer work? Are you doing your own prayer work? How, and she would talk about food, like the body. What are you eating, right? She was a big, big thing about, you know, very focused on paying attention to what you're eating. Um, not so much, it wasn't so much that she was pushing being a vegetarian, um, but she would extol the benefits of, you know, of healthy eating. One of them that, um, um, and then once in a while you come across something, this is for me, very helpful in dismantling that danger of a single story is they didn't get everything right. 
Like my, I love bringing them down off the pedestals a bit so that Charles and Myrtle, and in this case, Myrtle, she's just like you and I. She's just like you and I. You can do absolutely anything she did and she didn't get it all right. She was practicing and experimenting and trying something out and let me try it for a while. She was being disciplined in her practices to see what emerged, to see what, what came from that, to see what the results were. And that's what, what we do. Well, that's what I'd like us to be doing, but we more often have a tendency to try something for a week or two and it didn't work out, so I'm gonna go do something else. So we snorkel rather than scuba dive. Myrtle liked to scuba dive. Um, and so, but, but again, like the not getting everything right then, there's one letter where she, she tells a, a woman that um, the woman has written to her and one of the things she has supposedly is anemia. So Myrtle writes back and she's telling her, um, at one point in the letter, she's inviting her to eat more lemons and limes for, for you know, particular, you know, the benefits of those on the body. And then she tells her that her anemia is caused by the misuse of marital organs. I'm just going to leave that with you. Now, it's again, I'm not disparaging Myrtle Fillmore. I'm just wanting to, you know, it's one of those things that okay, didn't get it all right. And looking, it's for me, I take it more as an invitation to look at the human body. How am I using this body, right? How am I using this body? Am I resting this body? What nutrition, what fuel am I putting into this body, right? Am I caring for it in the context of I'm part of earth? Am I caring for it in terms of my relationships, right? Are they compassionate? Are they kind? Are they giving? Not that they're tension free, but is there space for us to move together and be together? And then in one letter, she says, you know, we're not, it's not that we're so concerned about the outcomes, right? So it's not so much about looking at, got to look at the end, got to look at the end, gotta, but rather that healing is, um, you know, but more concerned with the shift in consciousness that makes the results abiding. So it's coming back to consciousness, meaning what am I aware of? What am I acknowledging? How am I changing what I'm doing, my practices, my demonstration, my behaviors, right? And what am I doing for that that makes results abiding rather than, you know, let's just look at the outcome. Here's where I'm going, right? Here's the end of the journey. She was very much, um, it, it was, and again, it's not an either or, it's not not, paying attention to that, right? Am I looking, am I focusing on um, process or am I focusing on outcome? Like, which is more important? And for me, it's one of those that when someone says, which is more important, the process or the outcome? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's not, you know, there's not an, didn't we, I just did a paradox thing a couple months ago, right? It's not an either or. Um, of course, I'm, I may, you know, I have a, um, a, a vision, you know, a, the imagination and it is process. Right, she says that healing is a two step process. Step one is believe. So, my question is, well, what are you believing? And you know, right off the bat, people say, well, there's one presence, there's one power. No, 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 no. What are you believing? What is what are the unconscious, unassumption, you know, um, beliefs, the unexamined that are really driving what you do? And we get to those by being still right? Hence the meditation. We get to those by looking at what drives us, our behavior. So step one is believing. Am I believing in process? Am I believing in outcome? Right? And, and really, what am I believing? Not just conscious, right? Not just cognitive, but what's being held within deeper. And it requires more inquiry. And then step two is being open and receptive to the healing stream of life. And usually when I ask that question in classes, what does that mean to be open and receptive to the healing stream of life? Um, what I hear is lots of nice sounding things. The healing stream of life is this, it's this, it's this, it's, it's you know, peace, it's, um, you know, compassion, it's the kindness, it's, you know, um, a lot of different things that I hear. And then my question is, is okay, and what about all the other uh, garbage that goes on in life? What about all the broken and messed up things? Is that part of the healing stream of life? Is that part of the healing stream of life? 
So pausing, right? The danger of the single story, pausing to, to what is the healing stream of life? If what's in front of me is uncomfortable, it's part of the healing stream of life. If I embrace it, it's, it's for me. I don't have to like it for it to be for me. So that's step two is being open and receptive to the healing stream of life. For me, it's being open and receptive to what is in front of me, embracing it for what it is, moving through it. So that's a, you know, I, I those two things, the, the step one, believe, step two, being open and receptive to the healing stream of life moves me through any healing journey. And rather than thinking of a healing journey as a destination, it's, I think of it as this giant sidewalk that moves through lots of different ecosystems, right? Through the desert, the Arctic, the mountains, the beach, the rainforest, you know, whatever. And periodically there's a bench. And so periodically I sit at the bench to pause, to reflect, right? To what am I carrying? What is my story, right? And the word story has really gotten a bad rap, totally. Um, but our story is important. It's ours. It's who we are. And we get to keep rewriting it, right? We get to keep rewriting it. We get to keep healing it. We keep getting to, we, we own it. It's ours. We claim it. The good, the bad, the ugly, the broken, the messed up. It's all of my story. And there's goodness in it all, right? So I think the that affirmation for today, and now I can't remember it, but it was about living life. Somebody remind me what it was. Glowing with life. What is it? Glowing with life. I still didn't hear you. Something about life. Glow, glowing with life. Glow, that was, oh, I thought it said something else on the slide. Anyway, yeah, glowing with life. Right, so I can glow with life regardless of what that life conditions are, because it's always there. So that, um, yeah. So I'm gonna pause on that because I am, um, because we're gonna talk more in the next two weeks about Myrtle. And I'm just as a to be transparent, I for the first time in more than two years, I messed up time zones with a couple of commitments. I'm really sorry I did that. Um, and so Cheryl is going to take us into meditation. I'm going to come back in a little bit to your spiritual cafe. I know you don't call it that, but that's what I'm calling it, to the discussion. Um, but I thank you for the time. Um, and I, I wanted to, I could keep going forever, man. Probably need to set up a workshop or something. <laughs> or a healing and wholeness class. That's all Myrtle. All right. So thank you. Go and glow with life. And I'll see you, in, I'll see you shortly. Thank you, Reverend Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I will lead us in meditation today. So please close your eyes or look one pointedly at something in your room and take a slow deep breath coming down through your nose to the bottoms of your lungs and holding for one second and then gently releasing. And as you breathe in deeply, Imagine yourself somewhere like the botanical gardens of Hamilton or the tulip fields of the Arboretum in Ottawa, or somewhere near you where they have a lot of tulips that will soon be blossoming the next three weeks, depending on the weather. And as you are wandering through this beautiful area of earth and grass and tulips, and the bright light sun that is shining through you and around you, reminding you of your oneness with God, with the truth. And when you notice in front of you, there is a red tulip, um, embankment of red tulips and you breathe in that in your lower area, you just breathe in that red, and know that that is your root, that is your connectedness to the earth. 
and you take a long, slow, deep breath in gratitude for your connectedness to Mother Earth. And as you continue to wander along the path, you come up upon this magnificent orange tulip. But within this orange tulip, you notice that there's some yellow. It's, uh, it's combined. It's a variegated tulip. And what scientists didn't know for a couple of centuries was how did tulips become multiple? How did they become multicolored? It took them a long time to figure out that we were all, just like we are all different coming together. Interestingly, tulips become multiple colored because of a virus, which was very interesting in our history to create something so beautiful out of something so challenging. And when they discovered this, they learned how to multiply this, but only in tulips, thankfully. And as we move through to the yellow within that variegated orange tulip, we are reminded of our capacity to use our thinking to change our reality, to create our present and our future and dissolve our past when we don't need to carry it any further. And we breathe in our gratitude for having the capacity to think clearly and adjust our reality when necessary. And as we're walking along, we see grass everywhere around the tulips and we are grateful for its beauty and its magnificent presence, its continual growth as it comes every year as a bed to walk on and to view. And then we look up towards the sky and we see this bright blue and we are grateful that we have a magnificent sky through which oxygen is carried to pour through our lungs to keep us alive and well in each moment. And we take a deep breath in gratefulness for this blue sky. And as we continue to walk, then we come upon these magnificent purple tulips, different shades of purple. We're going from the deep purple into that violet that radiates in our awareness, our ability to think clearly, to visualize, to imagine, to feel connected to the oneness that is around us as we allow it through us to be this witness for something so magnificent. And then we continue along our path, breathing deeply, just noticing gently each flower, each blade of grass in full acceptance of these many treasures that we've been given to remind us of our own inner beauty. And then we arise at this magnificent body of white tulips. This is the joy place. As we breathe in remembrance that we are joy, we are unity consciousness. The tulip, the white tulip is a reminder of that space that we can connect to and be one with in unity, feeling that gentle coolness and lightness that comes in that oneness and celebrating the many treasures that we carry. We are blessed to be a unity community. And as you continue on your walk, carry that in your heart and in your memory, the many gifts that you've been provided 
through you and around you and reminded of weekly through unity with grace, with gratitude, so be it.